There's a, a really nice fellow called Barry who's um, gone to the trouble to make some um, reasoned and intelligent, or to put in writing some reasoned and intelligent replies to my last couple of videos in the comments. And I thought, uh, I, rather than, than get involved in the comments, I thought I might just um, pay him the respect of doing a reply video to address some of the points he's, he's making. Um, uh, my main thing is I hope he'll, he'll keep making his comments because they're courteous and, and, and thoughtful, well, well, well thought through. Now what, um, uh, the, the main thing I think he's saying is that I'm anti the welfare state. In, he's, he's putting it better than this, but I think he's saying that I'm trashing the idea of the welfare state. That's not my, um, my, my purpose. My purpose isn't to, to, uh, to be uh, obnoxious and objectionable because I want to offend people who like or use the welfare state. I'm being uh, obnoxious and objectionable because I want to offend people who um, insist that it cannot possibly break down and if it does they'll tantrum about it and anyone who suggests it does is someone they're going to tantrum at anyone who does suggest that. Uh, tantruming about the breakdown of the welfare state or the possibility of the breakdown of the welfare state doesn't mean the welfare state or, um, won't break down. It simply means that you'll get more angry and violent if it does. And I think it's, uh, it's good to avoid that. And if I can jolt people out of that habit, then I'm happy to do so. M my main aim when I'm talking about the breakdown of the welfare state is not to say, ha ha, and a good thing too. I'm actually trying to avoid some kind of value judgment there. Um, it's simply to try to uh, uh, um, point out reality, because I think if you understand reality, if, if you have a clear my view of reality, however awkward and unpleasant it is, then you're much more likely to be uh, to be able to behave in a, a realistic and compassionate way. And my point is that the state, the existence of the state, eventually leads to a democratic state, and the democratic state eventually leads becomes a welfare state through the process of democracy, particularly in an unequal society, because you will get, as we have here in, in this country, a nine to one incentive in favor of more um, tax and spend. So for every uh, one person who, who, who loses through more tax and spend on welfare, you will get nine people who gain from it. So you will ine inevitably get a welfare state and an ever-growing welfare state. So the democratic state becomes a democratic welfare state, then the welfare collapses the state, and then because the state has gone broke, it can't pay any more welfare. Daddy has gone bankrupt. Daddy can't give you any pocket money anymore. But because I am so reprehensible and nasty on this point, so insufferable, then I think I, I should explain um, where I come from and, and my sort of background, my background values that I bring to it. Um, I don't matter. My values don't really matter very much. What matters is reality. And that is what I'm trying to point out because that's what I think is beneficial to people. Now as regards uh, the welfare state, I, I can't deny that I see it as having some um, r really qu quite negative or corrosive effects on effects on community and neighbourliness and culture and compassion, self-discipline, crime and general behavioural norms. I, I think the welfare state corrodes all of these, but it's not my purpose to um, um, to 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 denig or to impose those to, to to denigrate the welfare state for those reasons, in the same way that it wouldn't be my purpose to denigrate tertiary syphilis for the effects that it has on a beauty contestant. If a beauty contestant has tertiary syphilis, she's not going to be alive very much longer. So beauty contests are out of the question. And and, and similar similarly with the welfare state. If I think it's going to collapse, well, the bad effects it has are probably going to collapse anyway. So, uh, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I, I do think it, it has some bad effects, but those, I, I, I'm not pushing those. I'm simply pushing the, um, what I see as the unavoidable reality of the welfare state um, being um, about to collapse or um, being in, in the stages of collapse. Now, th another thing which I'm frequently accused of, and, and Barry criticizes me for this, is for being a, a, a libertarian. Um, I, I can't deny that I can see the possibility for, uh, for uh, some good, the potential for good in the breakdown of um, the state, the state system that we have, as, uh, which I would like to encourage. I would like to encourage people to um, 
be prepared to, to um, pursue that avenue, the avenue of, of the good that might come out of it. I can also see the potential for terrible evil, including eye-watering violence and mass the, uh, the tendency towards massacre, which is such a feature of human nature. I can see that arising out of it as well, particularly um, arising out of the anger that people who say that the welfare state is a God-given right, how dare you ever question it, particularly if those people are... Um, are in ascendancy because that anger will turn to violence who can we blame for this so um, but whilst I see the possibility for good arising long term good arising out of the breakdown of the state system which I see is just the, the stage the historical stage that I think we're at whilst I see some good in it I, I wouldn't really I wouldn't call myself a libertarian I don't I can I, I don't I can take, take or leave libertarianism um, it, I think it has some uncomfortable truths about it, about generally how, how freedom tends to be a good way for people to, to force people to organise themselves. But also, on the other hand, it seems to come up, come to some ridiculous extreme conclusions that um, I don't share uh, around uh, unlimited drug sales or um, the age of consent, which seems to me should be a year higher, if, it, if anything. And, and this idea that everything can be dealt with by negotiation in the marketplace which in some cases will mean just being able to buy your way in and out of anything as long as you've got enough money. I think most people um, don't agree with that and neither do I. I. I certainly wouldn't call myself a libertarian. I think that the, uh, what I favour is, um, is a self governed not a libertarian society, but a self-governing society. That's a society based on self-government where people uh, um, submit to law and create law and order by submitting to law individually on an opt-in, opt-out way, people voting with their feet, saying, um, I have a primal need to be a member, uh, of, to be within a protective legal system. I will choose the system and submit to it voluntarily. I will join it. I will vote with my feet. I think that is the kind of society that I favour. And one of the reasons I favour it, one, one partial reason, is that I think it will be more repressive. I favour a bit more repression, or rather self-repression. You, you could call it self-discipline or responsibility. I think repression is as good a word as any. I think there is a place for self-repression, because there's certainly, well, human nature is not all good. So you could call me uh, a repressive anarchist. Anarchists for repression. That sounds a bit dumb, and I think the word anarchist is a little bit too hip for me. I'd be quite flattered to be called an anarchist, but it's a bit too uh, ed edgy and fashionable. I feel a bit of a charlatan claiming that um, claiming that title, but, but by all means call me an anarchist, and I'll be flattered. Now, uh, as an example of the kind of uh, repressiveness that I favour, I, I just I'd say well, th th take a look. I, I want to uh, give you a little thought experiment on the issue of drug use. It's often said that. Uh, libertarian people want um, any and every kind of drug to be for sale. Well, let, let's say you have, um, let's say, three areas. Uh, w one of them allows the, the use and um, peddling of any kind of drug from crack cocaine down to um, 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 caffeine pills. And say the second one just allows uh, weed smoking. And let's say the third one just stamps down, doesn't allow... Uh, any kind of drug use, not even not even weed, uh, and which one will you? And you can join any one of these. Which one will you join? If if you if you don't take any drugs yourself, you'll probably say, well, I have no incentive to be in either of the counties that allow uh, drug use, even weed use, because in general it's kind of associated with crime. I don't care whether it's causative or not. If it's associated, I don't want to be around it. And so I think a lot of people who don't use drugs would think. Most of my friends don't take drugs. I'll, I'll join the area where it's not allowed. I don't particularly like having it around me. I don't like smelling it in the park when I go for a walk. And they'll certainly say, I don't want to be in the area that's full of heroin users and, and, and uh, crack users. So probably what you would find is in the, uh, um, the, the area that doesn't allow any drug use, that'll be full of people who um, don't take any drugs and in the area that allows people to smoke weed, I think you would only have weed smokers in there and they wouldn't want to live in the area. They would not voluntarily, in the same way that people who don't take any drugs would probably not voluntarily choose to live in the area where you're allowed to smoke weed. People who just who smoke weed and nothing else, they won't, I think they would 
refuse to live in the area where you can take any drugs. So you probably um, you would get people. Uh, um, those areas would be quite quite tightly defined, quite tightly packed according to drug use. To, um, tending people tending to prefer the areas of of lower drug use, and uh, as a result of that, I think probably you'd find quite a lot of weed smokers would say. It's okay smoking weed now and again, but it's not worth living in an area where everyone else is a is a, a, a dopehead. I don't think I'm going to do it. And similarly, I think what you'd you'd find is in the hard drugs area, some of the heroin users would, would say, I don't mind being a heroin user if I can be parasitic on respectable society. But if I'm having to live in a society where there's no welfare and everyone else around me is a thieving heroin addict, then um, I, I don't like that. I think I'll give up the heroin. I might just... Uh, live in the weed area or might give it up altogether and go and live in the, in the clean area with um, the clean people so I think th you, you if you get that sense of self that um, type of, of self-government I think you'll get feedback loops towards much more moral and moralistic repressive self-repressive forms of um, society which I which I favor I favor that I'm uh, 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 an anarchist for repression jolly good good stuff so I don't think you could call me a libertarian, given those kind of views, and um, just forget about that silly word. I just don't think it applies to me. I'm just just too English and uptight for that. Now uh, another point that Barry makes, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him here. I hope he'll forgive me if I get it wrong. Uh, it seems to me to be around inequality. I don't think he, he puts it this way, uh, but what what he's what he's what he's saying is that there are people for whom nothing is ever enough i certainly agree with him there and you might in, if you get rid of the nhs or if the nhs falls over then you'll find there are people who can't afford even basic medical care jammed right next door or very close to people um, who will spend um, huge amounts of money on completely unnecessary procedures and still not be satisfied and that's um unjust and thoroughly offensive I, I certainly agree with that I the, 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 the example I give is you, you will still get characters like Simon Cowell who was recently it looks like he spent a fortune on his face I don't know which I'd, I'd rather not look at his his surgically altered face or the bill that they charged him but uh, although I might uh, I might pay the equivalent of that bill to see him and Madonna perform a love duet but um, the, the, so you, you might get people spending a fortune on completely unnecessary medical procedures whilst uh, a mum can't afford a bit, of, a bit of penicillin for her sick child. Now, I got um, a couple of responses to that. Uh, well, well, firstly, I, I think what, um, when Barry points, rightly points that out, um, and, and that, is a, that is a danger, I, I think what he's really talking about is inequality. Uh, rather than, than absolutes. The, the reason I say that is that um, um, penicillin, for instance, or that we, now we think of it as a basic health um, entitlement, as a, almost as a right because it's so basic and cheap, that was the product of a, a wealthy industrial Western society. It's a pro the product of a prosperous society, in fact, a very low tax society that was in inventive. And that's how, how um, penicillin came about. So if you want um, these medical inventions to become basic staples, then make sure you have a prosperous inventive society, which generally requires a, a low tax society. But the, in general, that kind of problem, I think, is something that would be um, quite likely to be dealt with by um, through, through, through charity. I think charitable donors would um, fall over themselves to be seen to be giving money to buy staple staples like penicillin in order to help uh, a baby survive and also I, again on the, the charitable side of things th th this fellow James Bartholomew in this book the welfare state we're in it's a very good book he's a very civilized man uh, one of the points one of the things um, that he pointed out I don't know if anyone can, can corroborate this is that uh, prior to the establishment of the welfare state GPs spent 45 percent of their their time uh, dealing with non-paying cases, charitable cases, and that, that is why that is when doctors acquired their, the moral authority that they still enjoy today, much less so today, but they, they still enjoy because they were seen as almost like sort of secular um, 
peripatetic or wandering saints doing good works with almost half their time for no pay for people who couldn't afford to pay so i'm not quite so sure that you will get that those stark um the stark inequalities that barry appears to be talking about there what what i what i think um probably you 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 would get is the um between the very top and the very bottom is um a difference is lose the the, the people at the bottom losing the last two or three years of old age and that's that's not very nice but i th i think i don't think that's quite as tragic as people make out and i think that forces that would force um us to have a more um a more wholesome acceptance of the idea of death and a kind of negotiation and a spirit a, a loosely a more spiritual attitude towards it which which i think is is beneficial and certainly much more valuable i value that far more far more ten times more than um, actually having those those last um, couple of years of my life so whilst i think barry's um, objection there is an inequality based objection um, probably wouldn't turn out to be quite so bad in reality I still think it has some validity. I still think it is there. This is a problem of inequality of an, um, that happens in an unequal society. And um, I, th I think I'm, in a, again, in a tiny minority in, in generally thinking that inequality is a, a social problem. I think there are a lot of people who talk about inequality. And what they really mean is it, it is a pretext for me to get money out of your pocket you have more money than me that's not fair that's unequal therefore i can take money out of your pocket and buy things i want with it and but most people i think do not particularly care about inequality in itself but i think it is still a problem i think it creates the seeds for um long-term seeds for social breakdown now the, the the example that that i give here is the society uh, say uh, around world war one or at the outbreak of world war one it was highly unequal uh, there was a, a lot of a lot of inequality and yet there was a very a really staggering amount of social patriotic social consensus which enabled us um rightly to withstand um seeing through an appalling war and that was in spite of terrific inequality and i think that is a sign that most ordinary people are not really that bothered by inequality they don't mind they quite like it if their boss is a very rich man because it means it he might be less likely to to go broke i, I don't think people mind that the, the problem is taking my, my world war one example the problem with that inequality is that it eventually led after world war one and even more so after world war two to the establishment uh, uh, um, to, to, of, of the welfare state so democracy became embedded people became confident as to what they could vote into place they voted into place the welfare state the welfare state came into place in a big way after world war two and uh, that uh, uh, the inequality in society meant that there was and is or is now a nine to one incentive in favor of more tax and spend every one person who loses nine people gain from more welfare tax and spend that is a result of inequality and 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 that uh, the, the 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 cost of the welfare state and government's needs to uh, finance the welfare state that is going to break down the state read through two ways fast firstly just by just not having the money to pay for it but secondly by forcing credit boom in order to maximize uh, uh, economic activity in order to maximize tax take that has created uh, the, the financial crash of 2008 and i think a much bigger financial crash down the road uh, through, through credit boom in order to enable governments to pay uh, the welfare bill and if you can trace that back to inequality that people don't mind but it is it is a social problem that needs to i think a social a social issue that needs to be addressed although i'm quite certain very few other people agree with me on that although they might say they do if you want to combat or to reduce inequality you're going to have to do it through um, entrepreneurial methods around the means of production you do not you will not accomplish it via the welfare state the welfare state has not reduced inequality and it's certainly inequality has um 
risen over the last 30 or 40 years despite ever-increasing welfare expenditure. The reduction of inequality through from about the, the, the 1930s onwards, the 20s and 30s onwards, that came about not because of the increase in welfare, but because of the increase in home ownership. But for a century, governments and society in general have pursued the aim of home ownership. That is now reversing, as was in, in, inevitable. There's only so much that governments c can do to pursue that, making it easier and easier for people to borrow money against homes, increasing the value of homes, which then makes it easier to borrow money. That is now reversing. And as a result, we're seeing inequality uh, rising again. But it is not. It is a mistake to see the fall in inequality through m most of the 20th century uh, as the result of the welfare state. In addition, those measures of inequality tend to refer to income and personal wealth. They tend not to be so strong on, uh, on uh, commercial, non-personal assets. So uh, uh, they, they might count people who own their own homes. They will tend to count less people who own a portfolio or a business that owns a, a lot of properties uh, for, for, for rent or shareholdings or, or bond ownership. And it is those assets, assets, that have increased massively in value as a result of uh, um, the, the, the pumping up of the economy through loose monetary policy in order to create economic boom. When you pump money into the economy, that money goes into assets. Assets are owned by the rich and not by the poor. And it, in and it increases those asset prices and the rich get exponentially richer. And um, th that is, um, that I don't think that, that is not taken into account by the, the measures of authority that people use to say that inequality has reduced uh, during, during the 20th century, even though those measures show that it's uh, reversing now, that inequality is increasing now. Similarly, um, d data from uh, America shows that the increase in inequality and the evisceration of the middle class has occurred um, not because their incomes are going down, but because capital costs like healthcare or university or, or housing, those things are going up because the price of them has been pumped up by um, uh, loose monetary policy. If, like me, you think that inequality is a social issue, that um, it undermines, it threatens any community of interest, shared social, I it's shared interest between people in society. If you think that that is a problem, then the only way you're going to deal with it effectively is through some kind of employee ownership by addressing the ownership of means of production, the ways, of the methods of producing wealth. And that effectively means entrepreneurial uh, um, uh, uh, methods of uh, establishing employee ownership. That's something that I have an interest in. I've um, constructed a, a, um, a, a, a model, a system for doing it. All the legal documents, I've stuck them up on the, on the website. They're freely available for anyone who wants to use it. If um, if a group of people have the sense and the moral self-discipline in order to be able to, to adopt it and make it work properly, you're pretty much guaranteed to get rich slowly to moderately. You will get rich and you will drive your competition to the wall. They will not be able to compete with that. But um, my experience of, of, of doing this, of putting forward this model, is that whilst there are bosses, employ some employers, a few who are interested in it, employees, workers, are pretty much 100% hostile to it, bitterly resent the suggestion of it because it suggests that they might have some control over um, their own economic future and uh, the business that, that they work for, which is flatly contrary. It contradicts uh, what uh, the, the system encourages in people, which is to go to work nine to five, to do a reasonable minimum, to get under the radar, and then to get the state to take care of you and to tantrum if the state will not take care of you. As a result of that, and any suggestion of entrepreneurial uh, employee ownership is, is resented and um, detested by um, employees in general. And so, again, if you, that is another reason why I, f I don't think the collapse of the welfare state will necessarily be such a bad thing, because I think it will force people to address the uh, reality, insofar as people are concerned about inequality, they will have to address the reality of uh, reducing inequality. And currently people just are, are not prepared to do so.
Now, I point that out not because I'm hoping to get people to agree with me. I don't think anyone's going to agree with me on that, certainly not whilst the welfare state is, is still standing. I don't think people are that concerned about inequality as long as the welfare check lands on the map every week and the money comes out of the wall. But I say it in case to, to rebut any allegation that I am just some uh, hip libertarian who wants to see a fat plutocratic elite ruling over everyone else. No, the, the reason I had an interest in um, employee ownership, the reason I worked to develop the system to establish it, a legal, a legal system, a system of uh, a legal structure uh, to, to, to make it work, the reason I put in a lot of work uh, to do that is because um, I thoroughly dislike the English class system. I see it as thoroughly objectionable. It has no benefit and it is very harmful in every aspect. And I certainly don't want to go back to the world of overgrown public school boys throwing their weight around and crowing about it. Uh, and, and so it doesn't matter what my motives are. It doesn't matter what I think or feel. Um, I, I don't matter. What, what matters is pointing out what is likely to come, the reality of, w of what is happening and how people can respond to it beneficially. I point out my motives in order to uh, rebut the suggestion that I'm saying what I'm saying simply because I want to see a more unequal, more unfair, uh, unpleasant class-ridden society. Absolutely not. I am not um, making value judgments or, or trying to impose my values. The only way that I am um, making value judgments or attempting to persuade people about my values is on what I see as the, the fundamental issue of um, demographic invasion, mass immigration being an invasion which could just, um, which I, I certainly think uh, governments uh, want to use in order to um, just destroy us as a people, to make us have no identity, to turn us into homogenised soap, so where the English in England Probably, I would say, the aim is to get the English in England down to about 20% of the numbers. And so far, they're, they're making, doing a very good job of that. That, that is where I do um, push a value judgment. I think that is a bad thing. But I, and it is for that reason that I point out the prospect for collapse of this system, of the state system. And, 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 and it is for that reason that I point out the, the reason why I think it will collapse which I think is um, what underlies it, is the cost of pushing the welfare state, which I think will collapse the state. And then after that, I think we will then have to, because the state won't be able to meet our need for law, I think we'll have, we will have to meet our need for law uh, voluntarily through, uh, through forms of self-government, just voting with our feet to join system, legal systems the way you join a club. And, and then I think that will separate society out quite hard, quite firmly and fast along ethnic lines. And then I think we will be able to regain our own country uh, under ourselves as a people, the English as a people in England. This is our country. We're entitled to it. There is nothing fascist about that. And uh, I, I, I don't think that is going to happen whilst the state and the welfare state are standing. That is why I point out what I see is um, almost the inevitability. Why well, I point out that it is unavoidable that the welfare state and the state will break down. So I hope um, I hope I've offended um, Barry just enough for him to keep commenting. I am grateful for his comments, particularly the courteous and uh, thoughtful, uh, um, reflective uh, nature of them. They're quite long. He's thought through, put them through, he's put effort into them. I am grateful for that. I hope he'll keep doing that. If he wants to get up a little video of his own and get into a debate with me, that's fine, that's great. Keep doing it. And I hope this clarifies some of my motives. Thank you.